love you, man. I love you too, man. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> nice. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. And man, oh man, do we got a... We got a show, but it's only because <laughs> it's got backstory. Um, but it's something that really affects the both of us because... It's something that we've been doing a lot over the last two or three years. Separately. Erectile dysfunction. Yeah. And we're here to talk to you about it. And hopefully if the ads work out properly, you would have been primed a moment ago. But anyways. No, no, no. no, no, no we're not talking about that, which is a serious problem. But Yes. No, we're actually talking about public speaking. Yes. Um, never, ever, ever imagine your audience naked. I don't actually, I'm really, I don't know that I'm really good at imagining people naked, so I've never tried. No, like, I've, I've never done it as a technique for, for getting over stage right. I, I don't know why it would make me more comfortable. No, I don't but, know either. So. Um, no, the uh, icebreaker, yes. I'm like, <laughs> how do we do this? It's super late. We spent an hour and a half in the pre-show for this uh, arguing about the nature of speech acts, which yeah. is a totally different podcast. But our icebreaker, Ryan, what is your favorite act of public speaking uh <laughs> maybe we'll ask that as the as the question um uh, the question at the end but i would say my favorite um my favorite instance of a um a talk given or a, a speech delivered to an audience is probably uh and it's gonna be cliche talking about a ted talk but sir ken robinson Ooh. and his discussion or talk on and his thoughts on education um and yeah, yeah, yeah i know it's cliche to you know use ted talks you know sometimes ted talks are kind of overused or they're over inflated but uh that's just it's one talk that um it proposed a lot of ideas it contextualized an idea and it kind of reached out over the ether or the ethernet or whatever uh, and and actually spoke to me or touched to me in a way um and it, it inspired a sense of of positive forward thinking that yes you know what education is not hopelessly lost uh it is not something that we can just wash our hands of we must take responsibility for it and we must try to work towards a better system um, so I would say that's my favorite act of public speaking, or favorite instance of public speaking. Sure. And uh, we, Jim, we, so we spent so much time uh, arguing about what constituted an act of public speaking uh, in the pre-show that I didn't actually get a chance to think about mine. Oh. Um, I, I, well, I was mulling over, like, I've been to a bunch of poetry slams. I really love uh, Beth Merch and Janice Lee. They're a, a couple of, of amazing local poets. I love... Um, copyright leader and a bunch of bands mm -hmm. that I've seen live but uh, I think uh, best act of public speaking favorite act of public speaking that I can think of off the top of my head was actually a comedy routine done by a kid from I don't even know where he was from I think Mississauga uh, I saw him at Broken Sword Comedy which is a local comedy thing here in town uh, they bring in comedians from sort of southern Ontario and it's it, they also do a lot of open mic style comedy and he was about 17 and he killed it. He was he was like fifth in, in in the night. So he had to and he had to he had to go past some pretty good guys to to get in there. It wasn't fortunately all guys, but you know he's like yeah. So I'm 17, and uh, these guys are all talking about like their their like conquests and and you know like what happens when you're out drinking with your buddies. And I don't I don't have any of those stories. Uh, this, I'm gonna talk about a thing that happened to me in gym class. It was hilarious. He just nailed it. Um, but yeah, Broken Sword Comedy is a super good time. And I don't know, I love comedy. I don't do any open mic comedy, but I kind of want to try, but I'm always super nervous about mm -hmm. it. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I, I'm establishing our, our street cred. Uh, I have given a bunch of talks. I have given talks at Ignite Waterloo. I have uh, given talks in public places. Uh, other than that, and like you know, I guess random. I'm I am the in headshots. I'm the public speaking guy. I'm the guy who goes places and talks to people about headshots. Mm. Um, so places like Nerd Night, and I've never done a Nerd Night talk. Really, I just can't think of what I would do it about. But if you would like to see a Nerd Night talk and you're local to us, you can find it, the link in the show notes because they're awesome. 
Um, yeah, this is also my chance to plug all the local speaking events. Yeah, or um, David Yoon's uh, speakeasy. The speakeasy. Next time, the next time he runs it, he asked me yeah. to speak, but then yeah, uh, they had to they had to unfortunately cancel the. the, the but last we will one. totally link to it because it's yeah. super cool. It is super cool. Um, but no, the uh, uh, the other thing I do that's sort of public, I've done a lot of street performing with juggling and magic and stuff like that, uh, is and music. Now with the riot, we play gigs. We played at Ignite Waterloo. Uh, we played at Alta Crea recently. Um, we are exploring some gigs for the new year. Um, we are hopefully going to be playing at the Grand Porch Party in March. Oh, nice. March, April, yeah. I played there once uh, before with uh, when I was playing with a jazz band, the, Ber- the Berliners. Mm, okay. And uh, it was super fun. Everybody there is super nice. It brings all these like amazing local musicians out of the woodwork. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a great time. And we will we will hopefully be there. We're we're still puttering with the application, but uh, yeah, I have I have done a bunch of that stuff. But all, all of my stuff sort of relates to performance and um, sort of deliberate public appeals. How about you, Ryan? Mine's are are largely um, like academic and smaller group. It's it's public in the sense that there's other people in the room with me, but it's less public in terms of um, they don't sell tickets. No, they sell tickets. Oh, it's okay. it's um because they sell tickets for Ignite. Mm, yeah, it's it's more um the audience is curated is probably the best way to say it. Like there is uh, a couple common themes as to why the audience is wh- where they are, as opposed to um, more random assortments of people. I would say. I mean, they, when you go to uh, say Nerd Night or whatever, obviously there's still yeah uh, a group there. They're nerds. Um, yeah, so I mean that that would be the closest I for me. Um, okay, so it's sort of curated by interest. I mean, yeah, most talks are curated by interest, right? Okay, yeah, maybe I'm making a distinction where there is not, but most of my talks tend to be um, either academic settings or um, kind of rigid, rigid rules governing the the talk being given. Um, so I've given talks um, related to the gambling lab talks at work and uh, talks in the sense of like i stand up and speak in front of a group of people to present information i've done that a couple times at the college um ignite or engage because there's public speaking involved with like presenting your engage oh, yeah. Uh, about that. yeah uh that's but that's with a group of people so it's, it's a little bit different yeah. as opposed to you the being the only person up there uh and then for me the the most prominent bit of public speaking is again it's a closed forum uh, but I have a group of buddies who we meet once a month and deliver speeches to each other. Uh, and over uh, this past week, as of filming, we had celebrated our three-year anniversary as a group getting together. So we got together 37 times over the last three years nice. and delivered various kinds of speeches and discussions with each other. Uh, we deliver 10-minute uh, speeches that we write ahead of time and deliver and then critique each other. Uh, we give three minute impromptu speeches it's like the vamp speech um, your boss is late and you have to go and stall the room so you need to speak off the top of your head for three minutes kind of deal so it's just the mo- <laughs> the morning of somebody will send you a, t- uh, a list of three topics and you have to choose one and over the course of because the- obviously we all work during the day or maybe it's not obvious but we all work during the day so you don't really have time to prepare and then you just go and you have to that's, vamp for three that's minutes that's tons of time to prepare for three minutes it is it is it's, it's not nearly as vampy as say finding out 20 minutes before you have to speak which maybe we'll start to do that to challenge ourselves 20 minutes 20 minutes also seems like like i don't know two yeah we did a neat speaking event here uh, a few years ago there are some videos about it on the channel uh roulette where you mm. get up and you give a talk and you don't know what the slides are yeah it's super fun yeah so anyways within this closed group i've given uh, a little over a dozen speeches um two or three three minute vamps and then uh 12 or so no 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 more like eight um moderated sessions where it was a um uh, basically for an hour i lead a discussion of some kind about some topic that i've arranged ahead of time um so that that's my largest bulk experience and that's where i've had the most practice in terms of standing up in front of people and delivering a pre-prepared set of remarks hmm. so that's my street cred that's very it's very official <laughs> um no so, so the interesting thing as we discovered in the pre-show is that ryan you are mostly about technique right and sort of rhetorical device 
yeah you use your techniques to be able to reach to the audience it's all about the 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 various things that you employ in order to deliver well to 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 to, um hit your goal whatever it is and usually it's in service of either you know informing persuading or entertaining but that's the goal the goal is 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 to convey the thing with one of those three intents um and then you have various techniques that you can use to to accomplish that goal like what uh there's a lot of different things i mean it's uh well i mean first the main one is uh crafting the speech ahead of time and then knowing it so you can deliver uh something that's fairly smooth well reasonably smooth i mean various audiences will be forgiving you know Mm -hmm. like a Toastmasters group will be unforgiving of errors, but be very forgiving of you making it because it's a learning environment, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll they'll be the ones who will actually note when you say ums and ahs. Where I yeah. find that in a general, like if I'm delivering a, if I'm delivering content to the college, they don't really pick up on the ums and ahs unless it's really uh, bad. As opposed to when I rewatch the podcast, I notice every time. I say um and ah. I don't cut those. Yeah, no, and it's terrible. It's I cut mine. I yeah. <laughs> uh, so the that, I mean that's a it's not really a technique per se, but it is. You just you know knowing your speech, uh, knowing your audience, so knowing who's going to be on the receiving end of the the public address, uh, and then tailoring your your tailoring the content or tailoring how you say what you say to them. So. If you're going to be delivering a talk to a group of academics you're going to choose a particular kind of language you're going to produ- uh, pick a particular um, level of expertise or you're going to assume a certain level of expertise um, if you're delivering it to a more casual group you're, you might be more inclined to give a um, use more uh, humor to connect or to reach the audience but you're not going to use humor if you're trying to persuade them on something um, that they're already opposed to uh, they would find that like generally insulting. Like these are things that if you take a rhetoric class or if you take a speech communications class, these are things that um, usually are taught. But yep. it's it's it really it really works out to be true. Like if if you know like just as an example, if I'm going to deliver a persuasive speech to an audience that I know is against me and my job is to persuade them, I'm going to use a particular set of limiting criteria in developing my speech practicing it, and then delivering it to them you know i'm not going to be cracking jokes about something that would you know would be it would come, be come across as insulting i'd be condescending and you know things like that so i want to try to as much as possible be able to deliver um it's i'm really tired i just realized <laughs> seems legit i know no that's no it's, it's a lot of good technique advice i i i did do some some speech comp stuff and some and some rhetoric stuff mm-hmm. in, in university and i it's one of those things where I'm like, I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna lead a life where I have to give a bunch of presentations if I'm an academic. I should maybe learn something about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and ironically, now I don't lead a life where I have to give a bunch of presentations. I lead a life where I choose to give a bunch of presentations uh, in live performances and arguably in a podcast mm-hmm. with this guy and sometimes other people. Hello. But uh, yeah, the the my advice is simpler. Um, unsurprising given that my, my, my whole sort of look at speeches is, is more elemental uh, it's don't shift your weight I mean don't don't shift your weight I do it all the time you can see it in videos where I will shift back and forth I am doing that now if you are listening you can't hear it because I'm <laughs> stealthy but I shift my weight from foot to foot partly because I don't know where I want to stand partly because I am not looking at the camera i am looking at the viewfinder or i am like when i do it in a talk it's because i'm shifting around looking at the audience and trying to to see people and and let people know that i can see them and i move around a lot probably too much and this is unsurprising for anybody who plays in my D D game where i am everywhere in the room at all times but it is it is for me is it it is that is my speech tick i shift my weight and move around and i do that because sometimes i am uncertain or i am nervous or i'm just not mindful of it and the problem with it is it distracts me i spend more time 
more and more time to throw out a speech thinking about, am I shifting my weight? Am I moving? Which foot mm-hmm. am I on? Why am I on that foot? Why am I not on this foot? Where am I? Let me look at the camera and see where I am. Let me, do they, do these people seem nervous about the way I'm moving? Is that, is that, and, and, and it distracts me from what I'm actually doing. It also distracts everyone else from what I'm actually doing. It's amazing how conscious you become of your body in that moment when you're supposed to be conscious of something else, like speaking, or yeah. delivering the content. Um, that's why I love juggling. But you know what? I, I'm going to... I disagree with you, Jim, in terms of... I don't think the audience necessarily picks up on it as much as you oh, think. Oh, I don't think happens. they do. I don't think they do at all. I don't think but people it, should have the impression here yeah. that we're saying that people are no. always going to pick up. Much in the same way, my ums and ahs are not picked up unless it is very pronounced or yeah. every other word I'm searching for the next uh, uh, thing and... Uh, and I'm Jeff Goldblum, and uh, the thing about speaking is that uh, now, now, now I'm turning uh, to I Bill gonna, Shatner. I, I was going to go with President Obama on that one, where he's just sort of uh, everything. Let me, let, is... Let me be clear. Yeah, don't uh, don't get it twisted. Here's what I'm trying to say. Are you taking that from Epic Rap Battles? That was, that was, I think that was uh, one of the verses. Uh, I think it was. I, I actually, I was just, I was just channeling my inner Alpha Cat there. Oh, okay. Um, Alpha Cat, by the way, is is a, a, a brilliant Obama impersonator who actually met with Obama um, a while back. Oh, I think I, I think I saw. There's some hilarious yeah. footage of him doing his President Obama impression for President Obama. But yeah, he yeah. he was he was also he played President Obama in the Epic Rap Battles of History. Um, Obama versus Romney, and that I think was was from that. But but yeah, it's it's it. People don't really notice often unless they are like you know speech coaches and things like that who are keenly paying attention to that. In which case, they weren't really paying attention to what you were saying anyway. No. But I notice, mm-hmm. and I think that they're noticing because I think that I would notice even though I wouldn't mm-hmm. actually notice. Yeah, you almost distract yourself. I do distract yeah. myself. I I and. The virtue of video is that if I'm making a vlog and I distract myself and I find later that that is too distracted, then I just stop, collect my thoughts, and keep going and just cut that part out. (laughs) Unfortunately, live, that's a lot more challenging. Although I have definitely stopped. not Never in the middle of a song. You never stop in the middle of a song. If you... I did I did a show once I forgot an entire verse to a song and I just sort of kept playing through the chords until Kaylee started looking at me and I'm like desperately trying to remember the verse that I totally knew like 10 minutes ago and I just couldn't do it so I'm just like you know what just roll through to the next verse mm-hmm. never ever stop because then people notice mm-hmm. Um, in public speaking, in general, the people are a little more forgiving, especially depending on your your atmosphere. Um, I work with Ignite Waterloo, so we we get a lot of like, I mean, part of it is it's informal amateur speakers. It's mm-hmm. everybody is welcome to come and speak, and the slides are timed. But we've definitely had people who who stop for a second and go, "Wow, I'm really nervous," and then keep going. And and that admitting that sometimes really helps. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it makes it real, and it, but it also helps people understand and empathize with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, so the other half of that, for me, the, the gym side of public speaking is making a connection with the audience. And this doesn't necessarily mean persuading them or, or carefully, um, you know, delivering sets of rhetorical devices mm-hmm. in such a way that it that that they find your work compelling or interesting, which may in fact be why very little of my work is compelling or interesting. But <laughs> no, I think a lot of your work is compelling and interesting. <laughs> oh, I know, I was fishing for that. Okay, but uh, a lot of his work is compelling and interesting. <laughs> Quoted. Quoted. I'm I am I'm gonna put that on the on like my book cover one day. <laughs> a lot of Jim's work is compelling and interesting. Ryan Huckle. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Jim's of course will be in square brackets because it wasn't an actual quote. But no, it's it's about make, for me. It's about making a connection with the audience and convincing them or reminding them that I am a real person doing a real thing. Uh, like I said, most of the stuff I do live, most of the, half the stuff I do live, I make it all up as I go along, and it's reminding them that I'm. I am doing a real thing and I'm doing it for them and I can see them 
and I know that they're there and I'm aware I'm trying to be aware of their needs and that they can see me and that we we this is not a performance that is I think from the discussion we had before a performance is not something I do for other people a performance is something I do with other people audiences make shows great Mm -hmm. like you can have a good show with a shitty audience Mm -hmm. but if you have a good audience you don't have a you you, and you can have a bad show with a good audience but like if you have a good audience you can have a great show Mm -hmm. um to to speak briefly of my mentor and uh the wise master of music who i follow intently lionel (laughs) richie Who I saw in a YouTube commercial once. I did watch the whole commercial. It was an impressive commercial. <laughs> he was talking about a tour that he had just done uh, in the States. And they had a bunch of people show up. in, in Dressed up as Lionel Richie and his old band. Okay. And they, were, and they were in the front row. They were super huge fans. And he's, you know, he's, he's at the point where he doesn't take this stuff too seriously. He doesn't have a lot of people regimenting his tour or anything. He just gets on a stage and sings his songs and does whatever he wants. Because mm-hmm. he's Lionel Richie and he seemed really chilled out. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah. So I saw these guys in the front row, and they seemed really cool. So we got them up on stage and got them to help me do a song. And that is what I like doing. I'm notorious for doing that. I got Andrew to do a song at Headshots. Mm -hmm. Um, Anytime anytime anyone who has played in a band with me is in the same room as me when I'm doing a show, I will attempt to get them up to play a song just because it's fun. Mm -hmm. And because I like having audience involvement i like you know the audience isn't just the recipient of my performance whatever it is they're a part of it and they're it is in it is integral to them and vice versa but yeah my actual tip for that is and this is the advice i give people when we do speech coaching for ignite is have a feeling and then make that feeling come out of your mouth i mean we do this all the time and you only usually get up to speak about something that's really important to you. I mean, even if that is like we had a talk. Who Jay gave a talk on canning, but it, I mean, it was a, it was on canning and how to can and what he did. But it was also about how much fun it was to can with his kids. And the the sense the sense that you get from that talk, and I will link to it in the show notes because it's a really cool talk, and Jay's a really funny guy. Um, is not just oh well here's an instructional list of how to can it is that being a good dad is really important to this guy and sometimes he loses sight of that but it is really important to him and you get that across because that is a feeling that Jay genuinely has and he does a really good job I mean he's also really funny but he, he does a really good job of getting that out there like we get talks on all kinds of things and activism environmental issues and but all of it has the same is the same thing in the sense that someone has a feeling and it is so big that it is overflowing and they need to and i'm just like take that and just let it out in a way that helps other people have that feeling because if they get that like they're and they're looking for it then you're laughing I mean, whether you're giving an academic talk where you're trying to inform people, but you're also trying to convince people that this is a thing that matters. I mean, the big question that anybody who's going to ask after your academic talk is, so what? And they, they, they had better not need help to get to an answer for that. Um, you know, that is, that is the, the essential bit, I think, of, of you know, persuasive speeches mm-hmm. is... How do we? How do I get this person to have this feeling? How do I get them to understand how I'm feeling and why that why that matters? And that is as much in performance as it is, as it is in um, you know content or delivery. Sometimes it, it is entirely in delivery and in and in performance. You know, you can it is it is the notion that it is okay to let people know that you were nervous or scared. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember I did a show once for a uh, senior citizen's home. We did magic and juggling and music for an afternoon. It was a lot of fun, and I never played for people in their 80s before. They're a super good time, but they give zero fucks. (laughs) 
you're like, wow, and we just get up here, and you get up here, here, and we get a volunteer, we do a magic trick, and they're like, I am not moving for shit. <laughs> and it's not because they're crotchety or cranky, it's because they have been on this earth for like 60 years longer than me, and God help it, I will come to them. And I did, and it was a good time, and I juggled cupcakes, and but part of it was just, I had to, I had to help them figure out that I was just a guy who was there to help them have a really good time that afternoon and that we weren't going to do what I wanted to do. We were going to do what they wanted to do and I was going to make what they wanted to do as entertaining as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is how I wound up juggling cupcakes with uh, and, and, and double partners juggling with their, their rec coordinator. <laughs> it was a good time. But yeah, that is, that is, I don't know. To, to me, it's, it's, it's more about touching an audience than it is about just sort of delivering strategic content but that shapes a lot of my life in ways that are probably less efficient than they could be ryan is our efficiency guy so what is your what is your secret for touching an audience sir um i i think i touched on it briefly uh when we were talking about technique uh but really for me it comes down to knowing your audience uh, and knowing your audience that can go pretty deep uh, especially when it comes to things like um well comedy is a, is a perfect example of it but also in when you're trying to persuade somebody um knowing what kinds of common experiences you can draw upon i mean that's usually one of the reasons why comedy works so well is because mm -hmm. you can tap into something that almost everybody not necessarily everybody but almost everybody in the audience can somehow relate to comprehend understand or has experienced that's why we all talk about the weather yeah because it's something that everybody has some sort of experience with um so when it comes to trying to touch the audience or reach the audience um it it really helps if you can somehow and it, this is it's really hard to do when you're walking into it blind you know like um if you're um, like if you're not preparing a, a speech for an academic conference kind of deal, you know, I think a lot more of your speaking examples or when you've talked about open mic nights or not mm -hmm. open mic nights in the slam poetry sense, but open mic nights in terms of um, going down to a musical venue, you don't necessarily know who's going to come through the door and it's going to be really hard to, if you're coming prepared for a very receptive audience and you have a very drunk and belligerent audience. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard to know your audience in that case. Uh, in in terms of hostile audiences, I guess it's just going to have to be you know your professionalism. <laughs> just gonna I, have to. I recommend when you're, <laughs> like like if you're facing an, an audience of entirely hostile people, I recommend just beatboxing through the whole thing. Yeah, or just walk off stage. There's no, there's no point that, giving them but, the time. But I, I mean, know. like you at least give them a decent beatbox performance. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like your your skill and your practice and whatnot is going to ultimately be what saves you in that one and just your bold your bold um performance I, I think that all of those people even in a hostile audience have feelings yeah feelings but uh, i don't know i'm i'm a dick i largely don't care about feelings i'm not, i'm largely distrustful of feelings i realize that feelings pathos has a place it shouldn't be manipulated, but often, like, you use rhetorical devices to manipulate people's emotions. But I often find myself distrustful of of emotions because of the kinds of appeals that can go along with them. And that you can sometimes lose sight of a message because it gets bogged down in, uh, in emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a dick. And I admit that I'm a dick because of, of that kind of way of thinking. But... Um, I largely you heard it here first. Yeah. Hawk doesn't care about people's feelings. Uh, it's it's perhaps a little bit more nuanced than that. But uh, if you were to ask me or frame the question in that regard, largely is. Eh. Mm. But when it comes to public speaking, you know, it's I'm I view public speaking largely as performance, and so it doesn't matter what I'm thinking. Uh, or feeling so much as am I accomplishing my goal so am I th that would make me almost the perfect lawyer because I'd be the perfect shyster lawyer you know it's uh, Tom Cruise's line from um, um, from A Few Good Men I think it is you know it doesn't matter what I believe it's only a matter what I, it only matters what I can prove kind of yeah. deal so you know it doesn't really matter 
you know, the if I'm delivering a speech, hopefully I agree with it, but you can still deliver a speech in which you don't actually believe. Sure. And still I mean, but you, you, goals. Just, you just have different feelings. Yeah. But yeah, I, I to I sh- I should probably lay it out. Like I'm not I don't think that we should aspire towards the idea that we should purge emotions altogether. I I that's <laughs> factually wrong. That we just can't do it. I mean, but it's also the the entire history of western you know male philosophy that tries to prize logos over pathos okay you know. i i agree we should also not strive toward a some kind of vulcan paradise there's a peel in there but yeah it's maybe. i don't know maybe we're getting off topic here maybe we're just we're just a little too we'll save tired. that for our star trek cast yeah we're, we're, um the one thing we haven't talked about that is that is worth talking about and maybe we're, it was maybe worth talking about first but i mean mm-hmm. you know we've got a lot of context for it is stage fright mm-hmm. I and mean, that is the number one thing whenever whenever i try and get someone up on a stage there's always, there's often like there i mean there there usually there are people who are like super eager who are like hell yeah i got on that stage well you mean to do what hold this hat drop eggs in it yeah no problem there are the people who are trusting, which is a street performer thing. Like, people will give you a lot of leeway and let you do things. Like, yes, of course. I'll just... Yes, you want to climb on my head? No problem. Mm. I'll just do it. It's really cool. I love that space. But there is also... I mean, part of it is also recognizing people who aren't into it and not trying to pressure them into it. Mm. Because if they feel uncomfortable the whole time, um, it's it's not going to be fun for them. It's going to show. It's not going to be fun for the audience. But a lot of people I meet are the people who who just sort of quake and are like, I could never do that. And the answer is that much like juggling, they 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 can. Mm. It's just sometimes it's hard, mm. and I understand that. Um, I spent a long time being really self conscious about making music until one day I was like, Fuck! I need to make music, and now I love doing it. Mm. Um. Yeah, deal, like stage fright is a thing that a lot of people get, uh, except for apparently my partner who is an automaton. Um, it's not that I get... I get stage... I have the physiological responses of stage fright, but I don't feel the crippling... Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use the word crippling. I don't have the... I'm not... Debilitated? S- debilitated. I'm not stopped in my tracks and frozen... And unable to now. Now, given your previous reference to a Vulcan paradise, what I am what I am hearing when you say that is, Captain. Yes, I experienced the physio- physiological uh, responses to stage fright, but I just learned to ignore them. Yeah, no, largely like that's um, even even when I was two or three years into being a karaoke host, the very first bits of getting up on stage and speaking into the mic queuing up the music and singing I still had that surge of adrenaline and I st- I would get the shakes uh, I would be nervous my brain would be a little scattered that's the that's usually the level of um, stage fright that I experience and it's the kind that it it puts me on the wrong footing to start mm-hmm. because it gets me going and I get, I get really excited you know you get sweaty palms and you get breathing really fast or it feels like you've been exercising you know do push-ups backstage and then you walk out and you're slightly out of breath while you're trying to emote and you're trying to get the the the, get your first like sentence right get it down and pat so you can continue on and i get all of that but then after a while things just kind of mellow out and i and i hit a nice equilibrium where i'm you know you you kind of get into the zone but there's no point at which that stops you from getting on stage basically yeah, I can't. I can't think of any time where it has. Yeah, I would be nervous ahead of time. Like for example, I don't get stage fright getting up on stage. Um, I hate the idea of picking up a phone and calling somebody. That's uh, that's closer to what I imagine stage I fright. I do might order be. all of the pizza. He does order all, and some sometimes it's not online. Sometimes it's on the. <laughs> I've never ordered pizza on the phone. For no, you have. No, oh, really? I, I guess I just I could, but attention. I just do not opt. Um, to. But yeah, like uh, when I was working at a call center and I had to call farmers, you know, I was calling to ask people for their time, like give me your time to answer my survey questions, kind of deal. Um, that gives me pause. Uh, but I mean, I was getting paid to do it, so I had to do it, kind of yeah. deal. 
Um, going up to a patron at the bar and telling him, I'm sorry, but it is time for you to leave. That gives me pause going into it, but it doesn't freeze me in my so spot. So it's, it's, it's not performance stuff. That's like individual human interactions. Yep. Like there we go. We just solved yeah. it. I, 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 your anxiety, the source of your anxiety is, is not interacting, interacting with, with lots people. of people. It is, it is interacting with individual people. Yep. That, um, that's, that's totally fair. Yeah. Um, for me, it's it's I I get tons of stage fright. I still get stage fright. Um, it is not as bad as it used to be because, uh, and for a long time, I sort of thought there was just no way to deal with it, and you, like you ju- you didn't deal with it. You just sort of like you did the thing anyway, mm-hmm. and you felt sort of brave for doing it like that. Mm-hmm. You just did the thing, uh, and then I um, I did an open mic. My first my first like real open mic open mic few years back um at a poetry slam and i realized that when i got up there and i I like just banged my way through my first song it was it wasn't horrible i hit all of my notes i hit most of my chords I'm sure that it it is always it will always be more horrible for me than it was for the people who heard it who I assume have entirely forgotten it. But and people were clapping and I realized that most of the people in there are poets or the friends of poets or partners of poets and they have all been where I was standing and they were all nervous and they did the thing that they wanted everyone else in the audience to do which was to be the biggest fan of the person who's on stage that they could be and no matter how badly i did they were all going to be my biggest fans because they were aware that that is what i needed and i felt safe my second song was great uh i did actually we do have a video uh that i of a song i did play at the poetry slam uh, ooh, a couple years ago now uh, which you can find in the show notes, and they were a super good time during that too. That was my one of my uh, VidCon open mic application videos. Played the archaeology song, mm. but um, yeah, it was. It's I, I highly recommend if you have a lot of problems with stage fright, don't not do public speaking or performance or things like that. If you want to do it, do it, but find a safe space to do it. Open mic nights are not safe spaces no. comedy open mics music open mics just anywhere there's no there's no guarantees um places i recommend are things like um events like ignite which are structured partly because i'm totally plugging ignite but partly because one of the things we do locally with ignite is we sit down with speakers and we help them work on their talks mm-hmm. We, we help them refine their talks. We help them get a, you know, get across what they're trying to say, especially because it is a more structured format. But we also, uh, we work one-on-one with them. We, you know, we, we we're happy to review drafts of slides. Like you, you have a, a crew of people who have seen a bunch of these talks and who are willing to work very closely because we want to give people the best show that we can. Mm-hmm. Um, poetry slams are really great for that because it is hard to be a giant dick at a poetry slam i mean it's not really that hard I've, I've seen people do it but it's hard to get up on stage and be a giant dick at a poetry slam without them uh straight kicking your ass out i i, I think i saw one misogynist poem at a poetry slam it wasn't here in town uh he lasted like um 15 seconds like past that and he was just like ladies and i'm like and and, and everybody was just like all right you're done um, but yeah, safe spaces, uh, Toastmasters groups. We talked about, we mentioned Toastmasters briefly and they are, Toastmasters is a group. I am not actually a member, but I have a bunch of friends who are, mm-hmm. and it, you know, it is, it is designed for people who enjoy public speaking and who want to learn more about it and who want to work on it together. Um, I don't think anybody really there involved in most groups is a, is like a professional public speaker or anything They you just, you have a bunch of principles and, and, and things. It's not that expensive and you sort of work on it together every week. And it is really cool, and they are really supportive, because again, it's it is it is a situation where everybody has been in that seat, mm-hmm. and as soon as you know, as soon as you understand that they've been there, it helps make you less nervous, mm-hmm. because you know, 
the 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 fear for me is always that the audience does not understand how afraid I am or they they do not understand what I what I feel and I'm trying to get that across and that is why having a feeling and, and getting it out there is the most important thing because if they understand how I feel even if I feel hopeful and scared they can they can accept that they can understand that I am scared and they can understand that why I am scared and hopefully we can we can establish a bond about that rather than 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 sort of trying to cover it up and soldier on through which I am notoriously bad at <laughs> super good at hiding at, at hiding feelings but yeah um, if you have given a talk or a performance or something like that um, I want to see it I want to see it in the comments I want to see your cool things as always we want to see your cool things yeah um, for sure. so yeah leave us a talk Leave us your talks and your performances, even if they're boring, especially if they're boring. I have a really cool idea. What's that? Why don't we link my Ignite talk over my face and one of your Ignite talks over your face? Because I did two. Yeah, you can maybe split it up and down, yeah. so maybe The we, magic of editing. That could be our way of sharing or starting the conversation by sharing an instance of where we... Oh, man. My first Ignite talk is so bad. It's good. I like it. I like it. But looking back on it, every time, like if it's, people will occasionally link it to me, and I'll be like, "Oh, yep, I did that." The juggling was great. Yeah. Um. The the breathing and the the shifting back and forth, and the fact that I was married to a mic stand that wasn't attached to me or doing anything <laughs> was the straight worst. But yes, I think that's a great idea. So yeah, our, our you can find our night talks. Uh, back when they were over our faces um you can also find them in the show notes um by all means give them a watch but but yeah i really want to see your cool stuff because the, part of it is the more people who share it the more people who see it the easier it is to be okay with it mm-hmm. and the more supportive voices you can get for it mm-hmm. and we are nothing if not supportive voices we want you to be awesome we want everybody to be awesome i don't know about awesome I mean, I do know about awesome, and I, yeah. I, I do want everybody to be awesome. But I, no, just I just, I don't, thing. I don't really want to be awesome, awesome so much as just, just a teensy bit braver than I was five minutes ago. <laughs> and if I can just keep that up, well, then eventually I'll hit awesome at some point. Yeah, see, I just want everybody to be awesome, stay awesome. That's awesome. May, you know what? You can say I'm devaluing the word, but but awesome, whatever. awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> That's what it is. Anyway. I suppose with that, we should do an awesome sign-off. So I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this has been the Concept Crucible Podcast. Stay awesome. Please tell me we've gotten, like, the entire... No, no, none of it, none, none of it. Of it. All no. That whole pre-show um, where, like, eph- we nearly came to blows. Ephemeral and lost to the ether. Gone. It's too bad, but I suppose our friendship will live on because of it. I love you, man. I love you too, man.